Okay. Um, welcome to the part two, of the strategy workshop. Which today uh, I was wondering what kind of you know two words can kind of represent what we're trying to do today. Um, so I just made that that kind of thing. It's called strategic abstraction. Uh, an important part is just abstraction. Right. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to abstract from different uh, desert lessons, different situations. Um, one involving a polar bear hunting a walrus. Um, another is some city four, and also um, the relationship between uh, redundancy and efficiency. Um, the person who's going to speak about some city four will be Thomas Lee, who will be coming up at the end. So let's focus on. Um, let's not focus on that. That's incorrect. <laughs> Wait, are you yes. Are you recording now? Yes. Are you allowed to talk? Kind of. Yeah, you can. So, what is abstraction? Um, abstraction in uh, Wikipedia is defined as the process which higher concepts are derived from the usage of and classification of literal concepts, first principles, or other methods. And abstraction is a product of uh, th this process, a concept that acts as a supercategory of noun for all subordinate concepts and connects any related concepts as a group, field, or category. Right. So why is this important? Damn it! There we go. Understanding strategy requires abstraction. The ability to take lessons and concepts from different situations and be able to apply and adapt it to even more different situations. This is what allows you to be fluid and formless in your methods. So um, when you abstract these lessons out of um, uh, these, all these different situations, don't ever um, confuse them with solutions. They're not really solutions. They're just arguments. They're interpretations of various events that just simply happen. Um, and so when you, when you try it, if you don't learn and to abstract from different situations, you eventually become rigid in your methods. Your methods is essentially how you do something. And if you become rigid in what you do, you are eventually um, are susceptible to dynamic weakness. So what that means is that uh, over time, any kind of rigid strategy or any kind of rigid tactic always has a weakness in, in some way. So yeah. And so that's strategic abstraction. And so we're going to take a look at a polar bear hunting a walrus. Um, my um, understanding of strategy actually um, doesn't come from uh, business, but it comes from uh, uh, military history. So the foundation of my knowledge in terms of um, describing strategy to you guys will be very combative. Um, it will be basically involving um, a lot of military metaphors. Um, and of course, uh, if you guys are more interested in business uh, case studies, I invite all of you guys to come up and discuss your own kind of uh, ideas on strategy when it comes to business. But when I talk about strategy, I often use a lot of very military maneuvers. Um, so, polar bears hunting walruses. We're going to start with two, two things. It's a uh, foresight anas analysis and hindsight analysis. A uh, foresight analysis, we're going to take a look at a video of a polar bear, um, given a bunch of variables, um, think about what the polar bear might do in order to hunt a certain walrus. And then we're going to watch the whole video, and then let's see if we can compare whether your foresight analysis matched up with the, the hindsight analysis. This is Wild Chronicles. I'm Boyd Mapson. In the eerie twilight of the far north, bone cracking cold spawns groaning fields of ice and obscures the closely guarded secrets of a titan. They can weigh well over a thousand pounds and measure almost 10 feet in length. The polar bear is truly gigantic. But the tide of history may be turning against this fierce hunter. High levels of PCBs and other pollutants have dramatically affected the polar bear's ability to reproduce. As the ice cover in the frozen north continues to shrink, the amount of territory available to these bears and the amount of time that they have to hunt on the ice pack also decreases. In the Arctic, extreme cold 
breeds extreme hunger. The walrus, with its tusks and whiskers, is instantly recognizable and can outweigh the polar bear by more than a thousand pounds. Bulky and often bad-tempered, they look invulnerable. And to take on a herd of these giants requires ingenuity. By the end of summer, the Arctic sea ice has retreated, leaving the walrus herd to search for a safe haven on land. An enormous dominant male makes a fateful decision, ponderously hauling out onto the sea slick rocks. The rest will follow. But death is up and about. This polar bear's extraordinary cunning is about to be made clear. His target lies sprawled in the sun. For now, the bear will stick to the... For now, the bear will... So, I've given you... The video gives you kind of an idea of, or describes the polar bears to you, describes various aspects of the walruses, and also gives you kind of a situational understanding. Firstly, we, before we try and analyze the situation, what is the polar bear... What do you guys think the polar bear is going to do? Yes, they're gonna, the polar bear wants to hunt the walrus. That's the whole point of this exercise, right? But what I want you guys to think about, how would you attack the walrus right now? So the foot may web at the walrus. Is they, uh, so the video showed you guys that, um, that they were on the same island. So this camera kind of panned to this guy who's on top of these guys. So they're on the same kind of little island here. And uh, so let, let's kind of just draw the situation here. So this is the island here. And... Um, Here's the, this, this is kind of a rocky side. And it, this is the bunch of walruses. And they're all around here. This is kind of a flat center, you know? And the, and the, and the polar bear is kind of up here, and he's at, at a high elevation point. So they're kind of, that's kind of the island right now. This is the polar bear and the walrus. Any ideas? <laughs> what, what I think it was meant is to might go to the sea, so the walrus from the sea. Right, so you're saying that it will go to the sea? Yeah, right. But not like the walrus sea, so probably it will take a path that the walrus can't see. Right, so you want to, you want to do... Maybe a slight detour. You want to do a flank? Yeah, and then... And you want to do um, stealth, you will say... What, what happens afterwards? So it's a flank set, what he, do, what he does? So, so at this time, we're sending a note to the polar bear. Right? Yeah. So we're going to hide from the sea, so we're swimming closer and closer. Yeah. So we're not sure how fast the polar bear is swimming. How fast the polar bear is You're making quite good progress, actually. Um, is there any uh, other, other thing? Is that, the, is that all the polar bear is doing? Flanking? I can spot the ones that are far apart. So, so attack you from the water, but attack from the stragglers. Yeah. So, um, attack the you know. Stragglers. Um. Get the babies. Babies. The babies. Straggler babies. So you, so you want to focus on the babies, but let's think of the walrus situation. What are they doing there? Where are the babies most likely going to be? Okay, so generally center herds um, probably have their babies in the center. So the uh, babies should be in the center. No. I don't know how to draw a small bit of walrus. <laughs> Baby walrus. It's like a leech. <laughs> <laughs> Loving. Should be in the center, right? It should be in the center. This is going to get really dirty uh, eventually, messy. But okay, so all right, so we're going to get the polar bear. He's taking a stealth path. He's trying to flank using the water. He's going to target the stragglers, the the weak side, the babies. Uh, but the babies are not. But if you're assuming that the babies are going to be inside the herd, then how can he get the babies? Well, generally they would be inside the herd. 
Right. There could be certain, like, I guess, off the, to, off the top, the polar said you should be looking for babies and stragglers. Babies and stragglers. So, so, so babies. Probably crazy stuff. And stragglers. also, they're they kind of like climb like a cliff or like a wall. So, all their strength is used for climbing. Right, so there's a bit of a, a bit of a timing here. Timing uh, involving like uh, they're tired from from climbing up. Anything else, Chuck? Do you have any ideas? Mm, what I would do, I feel isolate. Isolate the babies. Okay, so separation. You want to you want to be able to separate. Yeah, I don't want to do this a whole bunch of time. Separate the babies from from mothers. How do you do that? How would you ever? How does one separate one from another? Babies are curious. You might want to have a distraction, right? Yeah, distract the mothers and attract the babies. Okay, so how does the polar bear distract? The babies. <laughs> one, of the, one of the most key important things you have to remember is that when you're thinking about how you can do something, you need to think about your resources and your capabilities. Does a polar bear have the ability to throw a rock? So although if you were a human being, that you might be able to do that, but, but the polar bear does not have opposable thumbs. Right? You got what a, think about the polar bear's capabilities. Think about, think, okay, so we've got an idea, a general idea of what, what are we going to do in a macro perspective. Let's take a look in terms of micro perspective. What happens when he actually gets there? If we're assuming that, that he's flanking, does anybody yet have any other um, suggestions of what else the polar bear could do other than flanking? Go in, only and one, right? and, yeah, there's only one polar bear. He could do a direct impact from the polar bear. Yeah, he could do a, like a kamikaze. Kamikaze! He could direct attack, right? But that doesn't, like, yeah, probably doesn't work really well. But okay, so let's move on from the whole macro perspective. So once he, when he actually in the water, and and gets in here and lands, what does he do? I reckon, I reckon the polar bear should drag one of the rollers into the water. So you, so you want you want to drag. They, on, on, on the ground, I, 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 I see the walruses, they can, they can attack quite viciously, but in the water their movement will be slowed down. I, I don't think it's opposite. It's the opposite. Yeah, it might actually be the opposite because the, wo the polar bear, although it's an amphibious animal, um, prefers to be in the, on land, whereas the walrus is a lot more maneuverable in water. But will they attack? I think you're screaming. Because the polar bear has too much water to jump. There's two grab balls to them. Oh, that's a meme. Any more ideas? There must be rocks that the bears can hide behind. Yeah. yeah. Or Okay, we, we've, we looked at uh, kind of like the early game. We looked at uh, what he might do early on. How does he... Also, also will yeah. walrus actually go to sleep on the land? Right. Well, well, that's a good question. What is the walrus is doing on the, on the land anyway? Some baby. Uh, no, some baby, they're resting probably. You know, just, they might like to do that. That's all really they're doing. Yeah. So, we've looked, this is the early part, right? What happens, what happens when he lands? What happens if he, he lands on his... One of his, one of the wolf, baby wolves. Let's say he finds a bulb of baby wolves. What does he do next? Drags it away. Drags it away. What does he? Drags it away into water. No, no. To land where the but is. but all the wolves are here, so they're dragging into the walruses. Yeah, I think I think you need to try to drag the wolves into the water. No, but if you kill kill the wolves, like how fast can polar bear kill the wolves? Like, if they can kill it straight away, then I don't think they'll try to carry that body away. Yeah. Well, well, assuming that it's attacking a baby walrus, then there's one bite or something. As well as they take it out. Bit of a struggle, but wouldn't be too much. Of a, it wouldn't be too much of a problem. But the, but the key thing is is that 
is that, is that the, 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 the polar bear, let's, let's do kind of thing, right? So all of these are, all of these are walruses and they're packed tightly. You saw them really packed tightly, right? The polar bear comes up here, right? He gets on, attacks one of them. But, but imagine yourself, if you, if you were going to do an attack here, you're going to be surrounded by walruses. So Sure, you want one might attack the corner ones, right? This is assuming the baby or whatever the target is on the coast, because the real, the key thing is here is that you can't really attack the center, can you? The, the, there's too many big walruses. In fact, you saw the first when the first video, you saw the male walruses get on first. Most likely, the male walruses are probably here. Oh yeah. Male walruses are here, right? Um, so, so, so. There's obviously maybe, I don't know, maybe not, not males, but not necessarily babies either over here. But, but he can't really attack the, the, the center. He can't attack really the, the front. He's going to only attack the back. But if he t attacks the back, he's, he's surrounded by you know, the center and the and outer part of the walrus. What will we do? Are you guys stopped? Do you guys want to move on? Did you see the answer? Uh, I'll say so can you attack the corner one? I think I'll just the back of the back. Corner? This kind of matches up with kind of the stragglers, right? Get the ones who are a little bit f more further away from the from the center, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a look. Shadows. He begins his descent from high up on the rocks. At first, moving away from his prey. He has chosen a difficult and precarious route, but the bear is careful and deliberate. Had he attacked from above, he would have plunged headlong into big strong males at the center of the pack and driven easier targets directly into the sea. But an amphibious assault may confuse them, leaving the most vulnerable open to attack. The bear is taking an enormous risk. Walruses are big and dangerously powerful. But on the polar bear side is the element of surprise. He approaches from downwind, barely visible against the water. An avalanche of stabbing hulks nearly drives him back into the sea. But he spotted his quarry. The mother struggles mightily to her calf's defense, yet there's nothing she can do to save the young walrus. Panic ripples through the herd, sending mothers and calves tumbling into the sea. The herd watches from the water, safe in the knowledge that the bear will not attack them here. Then within minutes, panic turns to indifference. The males resume basking, just a few yards from the bear, the loss of a young life forgotten. Perhaps the bear has hunted this way before, year after year, refining an audacious technique. Or maybe it was just a clever predator's inspired moment. In the end, this giant male took on an entire walrus herd and came away with a hard-won meal that will help him survive another winter. Check for wild conifers on your local... So this is one of the, this actually video is actually really, really good. I found it a couple, uh, about a, a couple weeks ago. And, it, and actually you can learn a lot of things from this one video of, of walruses. And so you can see that what we, what we did just then actually, you know, they, they majoritarily kind of matched up to what the, what the polar bear ended up doing. Um, 
we'll get to the, uh, the problems of um, anachronism, strategic anachronism, both uh, hindsight analysis and foresight analysis. But before first, let's, let's take a look at the exact kind of things that I prepared earlier about what this walrus was actually doing. I mean, what this polar bear was actually doing. Right. So, the first one is obviously flanking. Now, problem with flanking, right? There is, there is a problem with, uh, with flanking. Um, do you guys know what the problem with flanking is? If you ever try to flank uh, a formation. Flanking means. Flanking, okay, so um, flanking comes from the, back in ancient, ancient times, people would fight in the big line formations, right? Um, uh, in terms of the Greek armies, you would have phalanxes, um, but there'd be a lot more space in between, but essentially spears pointing out, spears pointing out, spears pointing out, right? And then the, the other person would have also have a corresponding line. This was the day before guns, but flanking doesn't, the flanking is still used in modern warfare. So the idea is that um, um, this, is the, this is the attacking line, so you could, you could kind of say that their direction is this, this way, right? So flanking would be to attack or to now um, either on a lateral direction or from, from behind. That's what a flanking is. If it comes from this side, it's a flank. If it comes from that and behind, it's also a flanking. So the both, both ways are considered flanking. Now, so imagine yourself as, say, let's say you were an army in um, ancient days, 2000 BC, and you were tasked with to flank the battle line of, um, I don't know, the Persian army. You were, let's say you were tasked by Alexander the Great. This is actually a classic move by Alexander the Great. If you take a look at the Battle of Guagamala, and you were, you were tasked to flank there. Now, let's say you were given a choice um, of what you, what you could bring, how many men you could bring, what kind of weapons you could bring, what kind of animals you might use. What would you pick? Well, and why would you pick it? Think about what it takes to flank. You need speed. Well, let's say you don't have speed. What happens if you, do, if you don't have speed? How can you make up for um, the lack of speed? Element of surprise. Surprise? How do you get surprise? What? You hide. Stealth. You have your stealth capability. Right. So you can have speed or stealth, or you can have both. At any case, you need to have greater speed or greater stealth, so much so that the enemy is not able to react to you. Because if the enemy is able to react to you and see you kind of slowly plodding by, it'd be able to just adjust the line so then your flanking is pointless because then you're attacking straight up, right? So the only time flanking is useful is when you have enough speed so that they can't react, or enough stealth so they don't even know that you're even doing it, right? But one thing is, uh, is not an important part is that flanking makes you vulnerable. If you start, the, the moment you start trying to flank, you become a vulnerable target. You get separated from the rest of the team, from the rest of your group. So flanking itself, it may be an offensive maneuver, but it's also a risky maneuver. It's a risky maneuver, and so the only way you can reduce the risk of the maneuver is through speed and stealth as well. Um, so that's kind of um, confirms the maxim of like a good defense is a good offense as well. So how did the polar bear? Did the polar bear have speed, or did the polar bear have stealth? Yeah, they use stealth. How did it get stealth? Did it, did it activate its cloak devices? Obviously not. It used the environment, obviously. It used the environment as part of its uh, stealth capability. So this is a, a really important because the, the concept of flanking depends a lot on uh, not only what your enemy is doing or the way they do it, they're thinking about, is also the terrain um, of it. So for example, if there was a big mountain here, you're not going to be able to flank, are you? Um, but obviously, if you had, if you had, but then again, if you had aircraft, then obviously you would you would negate the, the terrain advantage of, of the mountains here, and so one of the things we saw on the island was that it gave uh, there was a big defilade. Defilade is not a name for cover, that allowed the polar bear to use it to to a stealth. So use it as an environment um, as a part of the stealth. The second part was like uh, focusing on the weak. Now, weak. What can you tell me? What weak things there were in the video you just saw. What were the weak things? So the polar bear focused on the weak. You said the babies, right? So baby was. Yeah? So the females were probably weak as well. <laughs> J 
just think about this animals, not humans. Um, but, okay, so what else was weak though? It was more than just, just the target itself. Yeah, see, that's, that's all parts of the weakness, so there's that the males are slow. Are they just slow or do they don't care? We'll get onto that later, but well, we could see that <laughs> they didn't do much, did they? But um, what else was weak? It was weak. Have you ever guys heard of the path of le least resistance? Path of least resistance. Think of water. Water, water flows on a waterfall. Water always takes the path of least resistance, right? Electricity, electricity, the, the greatest current goes towards the path of least resistance. It's always the path of least resistance that they take. What's the path of least resistance here? Well, it's not just the target, it's not just the end point. End point is weak, yes, but also the, 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 the route he took was, um, was weak as well, unguarded, unscouted, except for that one walrus that met the polar bear. Yeah, so, so the, the path he took was also weak in the sense there was no, there was no protection um, against the, war, uh, the, the polar bear to take that path. But um, except for that one walrus that you saw. But we'll get onto that specifically because that's a special case. The next part is obviously um, scouting and observation. The, war, the, uh, the polar bear did take into account into looking at the, at the enemy and also himself. So he understood he had his amphibious cap capability. He also understood that um, that walruses are better in water than they are on land. So another interesting thing is that, did you pick up on the orientation? During the start of the video, it said the summer has ended. When it, when it, that's when, that's time of, um, when the summer has ended or the icebergs have ended, also um, melted away, which means the only things that the walruses can land on when they want to rest is rocks. Think about, uh, this is even more macro than the current situation. The idea that polar bear might, might have known to be at a permanent rock, rocky settlement instead of you know, trying to look for some icebergs. So that itself is a, is a, is a form of strategy, keeping yourself, putting yourself in a, in a better position, an advantageous position. Here he put himself in a position where, uh, assuming the, world was, uh, the polar bear knew about this, he knew that the polar would eventually come to, the, to him. So he didn't need to seek, him, seek the walruses out. He just had to wait at a rocky settlement. So that's, that's a really important aspect because if you read The Art of War, um, understanding um, the time and weather is uh, incredibly important to how you plan out your activities. Another uh, important part is um, the idea of um, haste. Amphibious operations are very um, based on uh, uh, one of the most complex operations in uh, modern day um, history. So when you're on the beach, and if you ever attack from the beach, one of the key things is to get off the beach as soon as possible. Don't dwell around on the beach because at the moment, the, the longer you're on the beach, uh, the more vulnerable you are. This is only true for land animals. For certain animals, uh, uh, would, and of course, uh, assuming from a human, human perspective, you're much weaker on the beach than you are on land because the beach has less defilade and also you're much slower. The sand doesn't allow better traction. The water also slows you down. Um, I'm, take, I'm, uh, I'm actually talking about the Omaha beach landing, um, the one that the US did when they landed in Normandy during World War II. But um, for the polar bear itself, he, um, he essentially utilized haste in order to, um, he didn't dawdle around on the beach front. He attacked, he quickly did, did it, you know, and he tried to get out of the water as much as possible. Not a, number seven. There's also another very important thing. This is actually taken out of um, out of war as well. Um, in the polar bear knew when, when to stop. He was not tempted by small opportunities. One of the key things of um, the art of war says is really important is that you can goad an arrogant enemy by offering small victories to distract them from the bigger picture. What that means is that if your enemy is arrogant, it's oftentimes um, from a military perspective, your enemy could be arrogant, but also um, even in a business perspective, in a game your perspective, um, maybe you just don't like somebody, um, and they're ag arrogant, you can offer small victories to distract them and so that you can actually um, execute a better picture. So the polar bear obviously was not distracted by the other small babies flying around. He went for the target, that's all he needed, and he went for that one. That number eight is called shock and awe. Has anybody ever heard of this term? You heard of it? 
No, so shock and awe is the modern land war doctrine of the American army um, used in Iraq war and Af Afghanistan war. Um, the idea is basically um, you take control of the, the battlefield very, very quickly, overwhelming firepower, you destroy the, the enemy's command and control systems. What is command and control systems? You guys understand what, what I mean by command and control systems? So um, in modern day militaries, we often have systems which manage our command and control. So um, that could be a satellite, that could be one of the commanders in his big you know, command base with all his electronics and computer monitors monitoring where all his troops are going, how much logistics are there, and blah, blah, blah. Command and control uh, um, involves mainly two things. Uh, the people who are in high command and the, peop and, 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 the, and the technology they use to help them to command. If you neutralize the technology, uh, because we rely, we rely on such uh, technologies these days, then their command and control is neutralized. So the more the control, then control is neutralized. But if you neutralize the, the people who are in the top command, then you neutralize the command. Either way, the, the, without command, they can't control. Without control, they can't command. Um, how does this apply to the polar bear doing this? Right. So the idea of the shock and awe is that by destroying this, um, the command and control, you cause panic among um, your enemy. So the enemy, in this case, was a whole bunch of walruses. Um, I'd asked you before on a foresight analysis that when the polar bear arrived on the, on the, on the beachfront, he was surrounded by, you know, surrounded by walruses, right? So the, the, if the walruses all stacked up and decided not to leave and decided to, uh, to have a, you know, uh, a unified front against uh, the polar bear, the polar bear wouldn't have been able to attack the baby at all. If they stood their ground, if they, kept, if they unified together, the same, the same concept actually applied to cavalry charges. One of the most interesting things about um, cavalry charges is that if your men um, stand together and they don't waver, they don't run away, and they present a, um, a wall of spears against ca uh, any cavalry charge, no cavalry charge will ever um, or, or succeed. The horses will never run into spears willingly. So, what's that? Did you have a question? All right. Um, one of the so if you, uh, there's a thing called hedgehog defense. Um, that's a modern term, but um, another much more ancient term comes from the uh, square formations. Um, the idea is that uh, this was actually formulated during around the 17th, 16th centuries. And the idea is that rather than having one big line which your cavalry can attack, with the hair or here. You know, and then you, you, your line breaks, and they all panic and run away. Is that you? You cut your you cut your formations, not by pointing forwards, but by rather doing a square formation. Essentially, you're presenting spears or your guns at each side, and what they would do is they would have multiple squares. Essentially, each square's flank here, the points of weakness, are always protected by another square, so resulting in a kind of an echelon formation. What that meant is that your their cavalry would always, uh, when, they, when they did a massive cavalry charge, it would run across all the cavalry. That's all they would do. They would never actually ever attack a square. And so, that, so square formations was formulated as a defense against cavalry charges. How does this apply to the, pol the, the polar bear and the walruses? If the walruses had kept up their formation in the sense of keeping it pack, tightly packed, not trying to panic and run away, the polar bear would not have been able to attack the baby. And you could see from the video that uh, the, the, uh, the person did say that the polar bear almost lost his footing, lost when or pushed back into the water because of the amount of walruses that were there. Now, uh, <clears throat> in, order to, in order to break up a formation, like Chuck said about separation, you could do a distraction, or you could destroy the command and control systems. How do you, now, obviously the walruses don't have command technology, they don't have control technology, but the, but the, 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 you could say they might have a command. Some of the male walruses probably were indifferent to the to the baby walrus. In that case, their command was pointless, it's useless command. But the the important part is that it was so much shock. There was so much shock of the polar bear coming from the amphibious operation, um, taking so much haste, using stealth, using the flank, that he caused panic, ripples of panic across the entire um, formation of. Um, what was this? So much so that everybody just tried to run away. Nobody um, thought that they could, you know, work together and actually stand against the polar bear. Um, this, what this is uh, equivalent to is essentially a form of terrorism. Um, the polar bear is a terrorist. The polar bear uh, has executed disproportional impact on a small violent act, otherwise known as a propaganda of the deed. Um, this causes a rolling flank, a cascading failure, which disrupts command and control and essentially um, is a description of a faster OODA loop of the, um, 
polar bear. Do you guys know what I mean? Any questions about that? Oodaloop. If you had watched uh, part one, um, Oodaloop is described as, the, as basically a decision cycle, um, uh, observation, orientation, decision, action. So these, uh, any, anything you do, any activity cycles through an OODA loop. If you have a faster OODA loop than, your, than the enemy, enemy could not just not another person, but also a situation, a force, any kind of thing, means that you, your, your, your ability to decide and act upon any, your, any kind of situation is faster than the, your obstacle, and therefore you can actually cause chaos to their ability to react. So essentially what that means is that you're being proactive. Uh, you're being proactively proactive, and you're by having a faster ODA loop, you are making your enemy react to you. Because the faster you do it, the, the, the means that they can't, they can't decide. They take an observation, then they move on to the orientation, and by the time they try and decide, the observation has changed already. The situation has changed so fast that they need to reorientate themselves, redecide, but then the observation has changed again. How does this observation change? It changes because you have a faster OODA loop than your enemy. If you have a faster OODA loop, then the observation of the situation changes too quick for your enemy to react. So, um, does anybody understand when I say but what a ro while a rolling flank is? Otherwise known as a cascading failure in scientific terms. Okay, so oftentimes what, what, what would happen within a flank is that y if this was enemy line and you you had a, your cavalry charge attacked on this side and attacked this um, flank side. This would, um, this would defeat each one. This would run off. And then this would cause panic, rippling panic across each, the whole entire line, which would make each one run off. That's called a, uh, that's called a rolling flank, because you're rolling up the flank. And um, it's a form of cascading failure, because the first failure causes the second failure, the third failure, because each person's morale, each person's morale within the formation is dependent, statistically dependent on the other person's morale. For example, if, it on, if you were the only person on the, in, the, in the battlefield, and you had a 10, you know, 100 horses charging at you, you'd be, you know, scared sitless, <laughs> you know? But if you, but if you had 100 people next to you, then you wouldn't be as scared. But if you start seeing people running away, then you're gonna start running away as well. Your morale is statistically dependent on your your, com your, your comrade's morale, and so by 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 doing the overwhelming, uh, overloading the flank on this side, causing a, um, a shock and awe, terrorism, disproportional impact from a small violent act, um, a propaganda deed, fast OODA loop, and if you destroy the command and control, this eventually causes a rolling flank, which is essentially a form of cascading failure of um, of your enemy. And you could see this by the walruses just just just. You know, one, one polar bear, raw attacks, and then everybody runs away, you know, kind of thing. Even if, though if they all stood together, the polar bear would have no change, no chance. What yes? Is this like a person with a gun inside a shopping mall? Actually, that's a really interesting example. Um, school shootings is a very interesting example of this. Um, and one of the most interesting things is that it demonstrates that certain individuals, certain human individuals, have. Um, a form of bravery that is very selfless. You, rational economics would say that everybody would just, you know, not try and do anything. Even if they, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, proper, a prisoner's dilemma. If everybody um, cooperated, they could take down the person who's the, who's the shooter, right? Well, I mean, one of them might be shot, but all of them would at least, at least you know, take them down because he would only be able to shoot so much people before he gets taken down. But because everybody, you know, doesn't, you know, tries to uh, fare for, fares for their own life, the, the benefit of cheating is greater than the benefit of cooperation. And so they, they decide not to work together. Because of, th because of that, that's why we get so, such uh, horrendous casualties from school shootings. If people work together, then they could take down a shooter quite easily. <laughs> Unfortunate, uh, but fortunately, there are, there are individuals who are very brave and also very selfless. And you can see that from um, some of the uh, shootings that happen in America. Certain individuals do sacrifice themselves to take down the shooter, but the problem is that if everybody did that, then it would, be, it would be easy, really easy to take down a shooter. Well, unless, of course, he had a tank or something, but that's, that's, a, that's a totally different you know, situation. Uh, you need... And also that would deter the shooter in the future as well. Exactly, that would really deter the shooter. Yeah. I yeah? You don't reckon so? Well, he was really focusing on the immediate problem. I'm more like, oh, what's that? What are the root causes of those shootings? Oh, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, well, um, this is more of a hard, hard counter than, than a soft counter. Um, and of course, the last one I really quite like is, um, well, not, not the last one, the second to last one, is not blocking the escape path. 
not only did he take the, the, the path of least resistance, he also created a path of least resistance. If, you're gonna, if you want your enemy to fail, then let him fail easily. This is the same concept in arguing. If you're going to argue with somebody, if you're going to debate with somebody, don't press on when you win. Right? Don't, don't, don't make him feel bad about himself. Let him fail easily. Let him save his face. Similarly, if you're going to, if you're going to attack and hunt a walrus pack, you're not going to, you're not going to block the escape path. Right? You don't, you, your, your objective here is not utter destruction. You don't want to kill every single walrus in the whole thing, so therefore you're not going to block and encircle them. You just want to attack one of them, you're going to let them all escape. Don't bother with the rest, right? The, this is also in the art of war. Um, it's, called, uh, it's part of the sieging an enemy. If you're going to siege a castle, never, never block the escape path. Allow them an easy path of, uh, of escape. Um, al by allowing the path of escape, it means that you're not cornering a rat. People who are when cornered and also given no chance of living, they will fight as hard as possible, regardless of what morale there is. Um, one of the uh, slightly more modern examples, Napoleon, what he would often do is he would let there be a path of um, least resistance which allows the, your enemy to, uh, which, which allowed the, his enemies to retreat. As they were retreating, what he would do is then he would use his light cavalry to take them down as they were retreating. And that's a lot more easier than you know, surrounding them and using them as a full formation attacking. By allowing them to be retreating, there's too much panic, not enough command and control. And this is a very vulnerable formation. The column formation is a very vulnerable formation allowing him to, his, his light cavalry to simply just, you know, decimate the guys. It's pretty brutal. And the last one is obviously timing. Uh, that's a fairly simple, simple aspect. Um, one of the things that, um, that I wanted you guys to take a look at is, um, uh, this was based on the network notes theory, if you had taken a look at yesterday, is can you identify the crux, crux the system punk in this situation? So what is the system punk? System punk punct, should be T there, is um, essentially um, the point of cascading failure. What is the, what is the situation, the, the action that resulted in all these things happening? It, uh, in other words, what could the walruses have done, focused on, by, and prevented all of this from happening? Because a lot of those effects, one through all the way to 10, are dependent on each other. Like number nine won't happen unless number eight happens, number eight won't happen unless number seven happens. What was the crux here? What was the crux of this event? Yes, that could be one of the cruxes, but in, to, in terms of actual events happening, because you can't tell what the walruses were actually thinking, mm. let's just uh, take the, taking the physical situation as it is, mm -hmm. what was the physical crux here? But what does what does a wall does? What does that prevent? Why would you have a wall in the first place? Yeah, it would, it would communicate to the soldier that his um, strategy to shock and all is not working. He obviously expects all the mothers to actually and all the volunteers to go into the water in order to get to his target. When he realizes that, then he he'd be shot himself to uh, struggle. Yeah. So. And uh, this is, from my opinion itself, that you guys have all valued opinions. I see that the crux is actually the flank. The flanking maneuver is the crux here because um, if they had prevented them from flanking them from the first place, and a lot of things like not expecting it, not forming a wall, all those kind of things, if they had all done that, that would have prevented the flank. By preventing the flank, that would have, a lot of this would have actually happened. It would have been, uh, essentially, the polar bear would be incapable of attacking. I just f felt that uh, I might have actually took, gone a bit over time. Do you want to go? Do you want to do SimCity Four right now? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm going to skip the redundancy and, re uh, and efficiency relationship and go straight to SimCity Four. Oh. Yeah. Um, no, you. This is a. This yeah, is. Yeah, I was talking about efficiency and redundancy. Yeah. Yeah. Mine as well, but not flammability and cost. Okay. So you want to go straight for?
Okay, hi guys. Um, so today I'm going to talk about SimCity 4. So for those of you guys who played this game before, it's, it's about you as a Maya. Okay, let's get into the first line. Perfect. It's allow you to, to, to take in charge of a town, to be the mind of a town. And what you do is you plan, regulate, and design a city with, with, with the finite amount of resources and cash flows, just like a real city. And the way this simulation did it, it's made really close to real life simulations. So, so a lot of, lot, lot of factors involved in the game are quite real. And also with, with SimCity 4, the, the thing about SimCity 4 is it's not a deterministic game in the sense that if you do the same action on the same map in the same time, again, you won't get the same result because there's a random factor involved. As, as in real life, every action, you, they will always have a randomness of reactions involved with that. So, so uh, as this game is not deterministic, um, Different actions you take won't give you a, a certain outcome. Will give you a, a a class of likely outcomes. So you you could be one million dollars in profit, or you might be one one half million dollars in profit. So so it it does have a bit of variance, and and the aim of the game is to generate as much cash as possible and make everyone likes you in the city. So actually let get let's get into the game. Okay, so here's, okay, I better turn the volume down, but... That won't work. That won't work. Oh, it does work. Yes, that's all. Okay, so here is a screenshot of the same city. Um, let me have a close this. Oh, really? Or maybe it is Age of Empires. Okay, so the idea is that at the start you'll give a city like this. Um, so, so you you have you have a land, you have a river, and you have different sort of terrains. You have trees and you have different hills like that. Uh, could I? And also you name your town after a certain name, and there we go, we start. And so at the start, right, you start to build a network of roads, and it will connect you your city to the rest of the nation. So at the start you build a road and then you then you build a small branch of road sideways like, like a town would do. Okay, how do I make this? You can and then after that you, what you can what, what what you do is you regulate areas in your town like what Maya would do is you regulate different areas into different kind of zones so the green one is a residential area the blue one is a business and and then you have yeah then if you know that he built like a yellow area for industries area and he also built a power power plant. So everything as you you think you need in a real city, you need power, you need water, you need school, you need police station, you need fire tr fire station, everything. So it's it's really real estate game. And and as you can say every zone you zone will actually cost money because actually involves connecting electricity and also other services. And also every road and everything have a maintenance cost as well, just just like you would imagine in real life. And different amount of things you build will supply a different amount of electricity and and this is it goes on like just like a real city. So as you can see when you plant an area, it doesn't get get built straight away. It will take some time for the investor to come in and build a house and or build a mansion kind of thing. And so your city will, will gradually get built. Oh, uh, this this game I think it's in the. It already took him three minutes, but I'll say that took him about twenty five thirty minutes to get there. So, yeah. 
Yeah, it's like speed up. You can choose the speed you want to play with. And, and, and also he just built an agriculture area as well here, here, which provide jobs, employment opportunities and other stuff. But the hospital, fire trucks, school, library, and essential services in high school there and yeah. So is environmental impact accounted for in this game? <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, it is. It is. So it actually is. Because when you build a power, power plant uh, or, or farm, actually water pollution and, and air pollution actually take into account of. Mm -hmm. And that factors into the quality of life your, your city residence is. Therefore, more people like to come in or more people like to go away from your city. And also, you have a rating on the summit here. It's not shown here. How popularity you are as a Maya. And your aims get above 80 or something percent. And so it's, 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 it's real as you can get in, in terms of developing city. And as you can see, it grows more and more. It, you can even see how congested the road is. Like, and everything's ni nicely designed for this game. So it's very realistic. And you have helicopters, you have cars. So yeah, so I just watch a bit more. So he built more schools to cover the new residential area, and different school have a school zone as well. And so you only cover a certain radius, and more development. Okay. Yeah, and also that that's really bad for the environment as well. When you cut down trees, your your air, your air like quality decrease, and also. There's more water pollution, but I played this game for 20 or 30 hours already, so I know what's actually happening. And you actually pick up those things fairly quickly after a while. And yeah, he's cutting down more trees. And that's actually a smart thing to do. Would I mean. that be like a tsunami all of a sudden? Uh, actually, yeah, you, 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 can, you, awesome. you, you, you can design different disasters on, on the city. So, so like on here, right? Uh, I don't know whether you can see. No, it's not here. But but there's an extra menu down here yeah. that you can choose, like a natural disaster, like an alien abduction, abduction, or like a or like a volcano erupting, earthquake, or like a flood. Like you, you, yeah, you can definitely desi like design that in. And also, this is I don't think this is the newest version. So I think this a Sim City Deluxe or something for after four, and that's probably even more real. And this is a network of water pipes, and also you have to maintain. Pay face to maintain them as well. So, uh, so that's and also having water supply actually increases your pop population size and also also help your city develop as well. So, and also you, you can build railway networks, you can build monorails, you can build airports, and so yeah. So, uh, actually, I'm I'm just gonna fast track this a bit more. And you can build bus stops so people use less cars or less congestion, and and also you can get a, an income from charging people as well. Uh, so yeah, and you can you can also build ferry ports, terminals. You can build parks to make your area more desirable, and. And and also like he noticed that he cut down too many trees. Now he's planting trees to make it more environmentally friendly as well. So more trees, and also managing money flow as well. How much your how much budgeting you're putting into different industry, how much tax you're charging, and that will in turn in like. Oh, so you're the like city. Yeah, absolutely. Like in turn, that will actually determine how many people actually want to come to your city. And how many people moving away? How many jobs created? How many factory opened? So, is there like a democratic process? <laughs> uh, no, you, you you decide what to do, but people write to us. So, so if you charge a high tax, people gonna go away. But if you charge a low tax, you gonna go broke. Simple as that. Um, yeah. So as you can see, a city is developed, and there we go. Thanks for watching for the video. So. So, oh, okay, let's go back. Uh, how do I zoom out this? Okay, so basically this is a 
just think this is a real city, pretty much. Um, okay, so what did I experience from this? From this? Well, I just thought it actually ridiculously difficult to learn and start because you pretty much you're putting in charge as a mile of the city, and there's so many different options you, you you need to think about, and there's so many different things you could you could go wrong. Um, but after like five or ten cities, uh, like you start to realize what are some things you need to provide, what are some things people like would likely to make your city better, kind of thing, and you find out what your choice will actually impact you down the track, and you start according, you start to adjust them accordingly, so which is good. Um, so one of the concept in this game is called optimal supply, which. Roger didn't quite talk into that, but thanks for leaving me a gap. Um, firstly, optimum supply. So what sort of stuff do you need to supply for your city? Uh, firstly, there's the essential services. You have the um, school, you have the fire station, police station, helicopters um, in the nearby area. You need to supply utilities, you have to supply tr transport, transportation, and also jobs and factories. Um, so like things like that, so people are happy to leave your city. So that, but every supply comes with a cost. You have a finite number of money. So so if you supply too much, the amount of oversupply doesn't actually generate that amount of benefit. So in the long run, you'll be worse off. But if you don't supply enough, let's say if you don't build enough schools in your city, right? Um, what will happen is people will be less educated. Um, they can't find high-paid jobs, and in, in, in the long run, they'll be paying less tax. This is actually really nicely modeled because in your city, you have a you have an age distribution and uh, and the education like level as well in different age groups. So it's really nicely modeled. Um, so so oversupply or undersupply would cause a dramatic effect effect into your city. In the, in the long term. So, so that's actually really important to think about like, when you play this game. Okay, so yeah, so it's nice to have some extra services like jobs, transportation competitors, but this would actually use more resources. But, but however, like if let's for example say you have no redundant supplies. Let's say for power power like power stations, it's exactly the set, the right amount you need for power. But in this game, as time goes, power stations have a chance of going wrong as well. They they won't be supplying this amount of power for the whole time. They have so so things might go wrong. So so having no redundant supply would actually be bad as well. And, and one of the most more important thing I learned from this is a delayed effect. So an action you take now won't actually just impact you. That uh, again. Yeah. We associate with this <laughs> a lot. A lot. <laughs> All right. Okay, sure. Yeah. So action you take now might not get take effect right now. It, it, it will have a consequence down the track. Say say if you build a school or education like. Your city would be more educated, therefore would earn more income ten years down the track. Therefore, you get all your investment back. And th what this game teaches you is to foresee the future and plan for it. So, instead of re reacting to to what's happening, like even if you're under budgeted, it might be sometimes might be good to take actually a loan from the bank with a high high interest rate just to provide. All the services that your city citizens need, and as the game goes on, you also have different age structures. You have road road congestion, social dem demographic structures, and everything like that. So you have to see what's happening now and predict what will happening, say three years down the track or ten years down the track, to plan your services accordingly, which is very important and and, and really encouraged by the game. Like if you got it wrong, you will be You'll be punished as in having less cash and having less people come to your city, more, more people leaving, and your rating will go down. And similarly, if you get it right, people will like you pretty much. 
So, so how to apply this? So, so firstly, it's important to think about the the maximum amount of benefit you can you can get from a fixed amount of resources. So, as we know in life, all the resources are fixed amount. So, so what we need what we need to do is find ways to maximize amount of benefits to spread our resources in different areas. And secondly, is have some redundant backup. So have some, so save some cash in case something goes wrong, or have a have a second like option in case the first one doesn't work. And especially when the failure like will give a really really high cost. But at the same time, you 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 want to have a balance kind of thing. You don't want to save all your cash into a bank account and never use it because that wouldn't generate you any would generate any like benefit for you. And lastly, is think about the time scale. Like everything have a time delayed effect involved. So it might take 30 minutes after you eat a meal be be before you start feel feel yourself full. Like before you feel um good. And it might take five years when you start playing a sport to be actually good at it. So so time delay and how do you think about five years down the track or a few days down the track actually really helps. Actually, that's it. Thanks for listening. Yes. Really? Thank you, Thomas, for, um, <laughs> for introducing us, SimCity 4. Um, one of the things I often say is that one of the best ways to study strategy is actually to play games. Um, game, games are kind of like maps. Um, they, they're not real life, but they're models of um, aspects in life. And so it allows you to practice your um, theories and your strategy and, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner that doesn't result in too much consequences. Like if, you were tr if I put you into the mayor of a city, right, in Canberra, you're going to start destroying buildings and building all sorts of things to try out how a good city will be. A lot of people's livelihoods will be destroyed. So, um, and also SimCity 4 is actually um, used um, by urban planning and architectural planners. Um, not this game specifically, although there are games uh, which are designed to teach um, people um, architectural planning, urban um, planning, uh, city design, which is, uh, uh, which is more, they're more detailed, but SimCity 4 does introduce you to the concept, and obviously in SimCity 4 is a lot more fun than the actual ones that um, show you too many, lots of figures, tax, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, um, I was meant to go through uh, re redundancy and efficiency, um, but we ran out of time regarding that, so